welcome to a webinar hosted by the Object Management Group titled Analysis of Data Residency Issues. Thank you all for attending. Um, my name is Tracy Berardi. I'm Senior Marketing Manager with the OMG. To talk about data residency, which we've defined as a set of issues about moving and storing data laws, privileges of law enforcement authorities, etc. And there's an ever-extending web of laws and regulations in different jurisdictions, some of them conflicting, that is starting to threaten the ability to, to conduct. So I'm joined by my colleagues from the OMG to discuss some of these issues. Uh, Mr. Andrew Watson is technical director at the OMG. Claude Boudois is an energy domain consultant to the OMG and owner and principal of SEBE IT and Knowledge Management on the OMG. There's platforms and domains, as you can see on this slide, including middleware platforms, modeling platforms, systems assurance, um, and vertical domain specifications, finance, healthcare, security, space, industrial internet of things, and others. Um, to everyone on this call to consider joining the OMG, or at least subscribing to email updates to keep track of, of these issues and, and standards activity. I'll show you on this, this next slide just a small snapshot of some of the member organizations across the globe contributing to the OMG's work. Um, it's just a, a small group. There's a few hundred more not listed here. So apologies if some folks are, are dialing in and you don't see, but couldn't fit everybody on, on one slide, but it gives you a good sense. Um, it's an open membership organization. Um, okay. There we go. Tracy, your audio is occasionally cutting out, so maybe speak closer to your microphone. Oh, okay. Thank you, Claude. Uh, so this is our, our hosted part one. It was in May of this year. Uh, the first presentation was a general overview of this topic and a call for industry feedback. And today we're getting together because we have the results from that request for information, that RFI that was sent out. And we want to talk about some of the early findings, and we'll touch on the types of data that, that are impacted, the regula regulations concerned, the resulting risks, the way data residency is governed inside organizations, and some of the in the future. And then we'll conclude with a summary um, of next steps for the Data Residency Working Group and explain how you can get involved if this is of interest to you. So with that brief uh, introduction, and hopefully I didn't cut out too much, um, I'll turn this over to Claude. But I should mention too, we would love um, to have questions, and, and you can submit questions through the, the Questions tab in the Bright Talk uh, interface here. Um, in the Attachments tab, including a, a PDF of today's presentation. Claude? Thanks. Thank, thank you, Tracy, and hopefully um, I won't cut out. Um, I apologize to the audience for the, the fact that either there's a small technical problem or we had a, a microphone issue, so hopefully you hear me fine. Um, so just staying on this slide for a second because uh, Tracy was, was uh, occasionally cut off. Um, this is an effort that we started at the Office Management Group a little over a year ago. Uh, we had our first meeting in uh, Berlin in um, June 2015, coincidentally on the same day that um, the uh, European Commission announced the draft of a new data protection regulation that really raised eyebrows. Uh, and as we'll see, um, data residency is not only about protection of personal data, but that's definitely a significant part of it. Uh, in the successive meetings we had, we got uh, input from various participants about some of the issues uh, that revolve around data residency, but we wanted to get a more complete picture in order to drive our work. Hence, 
the RFI we issued and uh, we, um, the results of which we're uh, now presenting to you. So uh, in the RFI, the request for information, we had to define the scope of what we were looking for. So we put together a definition, even though we also asked the participants, the respondents, to tell us what definition they personally used, and we got some interesting feedback from that that I will talk about. But basically, we defined data residency as uh, issues and practices related to the location and movement of data and the, the implications about protecting that data against unintended access uh, from the standpoint of the owner of that data. Uh, some, of the intent, some of the access could be fraudulent or some of the access could be by law enforcement authorities and government. So uh, there are different, different aspects to this. And we clarified the scope that it is not just about data in the cloud or exposed to other jurisdiction because it's put in the cloud. And it's not just about personally identifiable information. There are other forms of, um, there's other conditions that cause data residency issues. So having done that, we uh, basically asked people 20 questions. Uh, the first nine questions, or really the first eight questions, were demographic questions. You know, who are you? Uh, what is your role? What industry you work with? In which countries do you work? Where do you put data? What kind of data? Um, and then, uh, and also, who is in charge uh, of uh, data residency issues in your organization? What are the various functions that are involved in deciding and managing where you place data? Uh, we asked a, a question nine, which uh, was intended to allow people to respond confidentially if they wanted to. So we said if you're uh, really uh, skittish about having your, uh, your identity published, we will anonymize your responses. And in fact, we did that for the uh, vast majority of the responses. So responses are available as uh, OMG documents uh, from the uh, OMG website, however, uh, most of them have no identification of who um, gave the response. And then the uh, remaining 11 questions were uh, the substantive questions, the ones about really the, the problem at hand. So what kind of data are we talking about? What are the types of risks, future risks, known incidents? And then leading to what do you think the object management group could do to help? What sort of new standards might be needed? Uh, what sort of regulations already exist, what external efforts should we take into consideration. So these are the questions we asked. And um, if I summarize in one slide the findings from the responses, uh, basically uh, they're the following. First, we found that uh, governance of data residency is diluted across the functions. You will see a slide, so basically for each of these, the seven points on, these, uh, on this one summary slide, there will be a detailed slide coming up. So as you will see, um, the, the, the governance is all over the place, and uh, it makes me think of the famous saying that if everyone is in charge, no one is in charge. So the dilution of that responsibility is definitely a, a finding and a concern. Uh, since we asked people what was the definition they personally used for data residency, we found that the definitions people have in their head or that they put on paper for us were too narrow, uh, very focused on privacy and security issue, usually ignoring that there are other uh, questions, such as law enforcement access, et cetera, that are um, also part of data residency. Um, we asked people, their thoughts about the level of risk they were incurring and whether they, they were confident that their estimation of the risk was accurate. And most people said that the risk is moderate and that they were estimating it correctly. Now, if you combine that with the previous uh, answers, uh, knowing that the definition of data residency may be too narrow and that um, there's not necessarily very good, very focused governance about data residency, it is quite possible that people are underestimated the risk, in fact, because they don't think of all the facets of, of data residency. This is 
uh, our interpretation of the results. Of course, this is not something that, that people told us. Uh, on the other hand, we had multiple concurrent inputs that the emergence of the Internet of Things, the IoT, is going to bring more risks in the future because there will be more data acquired from sensors and automatic systems that's going to exacerbate the problem. Um, we asked people to submit examples of data residency regulations and we got very um, focused answers on, on certain topics. But uh, basically, uh, someone from Germany quoted all the German regulations, someone from Australia quoted the Australian regulations, and it seemed to us that there was fragmented knowledge of data residency issue. Um, we had trouble extracting from people um, examples of specific incidents, not that we need that many to prove that there is an issue, but it is very clear that a challenge in working with multiple companies or organizations to define a roadmap for data residency is going to have to deal with the fact that most people want to keep confidential uh, some of the very specific examples they might have, and this is understandable. Uh, but on the other hand, and that's the, that was the final point, and, and that was uh, music to our ears, people are really interested in what we can potentially do to help in this domain, and the first thing that was strongly requested is material to educate people and document uh, the scope of the issues. So let's go into some more detailed findings. First of all, the demographic of our respondents. We had a good mix of sectors, uh, several companies in IT software, IT solutions, uh, military and aerospace, healthcare, and government agencies, and uh, at least one nonprofit research uh, organization. Uh, and that, that, that one is, uh, is not, um, did not hide its identity. It's the Fraunhofer Institute in, uh, in Germany. Uh, we had a mix of people who are users of the cloud, providers of the cloud, sometimes both, sometimes in the process of migrating to using the cloud, which of course heightens their interest in, in seeing what sort of data residency issues that migration to the cloud could present. Uh, we had people from the US, Australia, and Germany, but most of the respondents have either offices in other countries or, or even affiliates, or they have users, uh, individual users of their services or suppliers in their supplier chain that are located in multiple countries, which causes um, data to be transferred between countries. Therefore, that opens the door to the emergence of those issues. And uh, so therefore, they're already moving or storing data across, across jurisdictions. We, t we tend to distinguish the concept of a jurisdiction from the concept of geography because there are some jurisdictions that are multinational, like that of the European Union, and you have some jurisdictions that are um, within only a fragment of a country. Uh, there's, there's a state law in, in countries like the U.S. or like India, and therefore uh, jurisdiction and geography are not exactly synonymous, and both need to be considered. So um, when we ask people about their definition of data residency, um, we notice uh, most people sort of made up a definition. They, they, they were not able to quote an existing document inside the organization that defines the issue. Um, and we noticed a bit of a confusion. A lot of people said, uh, well, data residency, this means data location. Uh, and, and we really want to impress on people that there is a distinction there between data location, which is simply a fact about the data. The data is located in uh, location X. There's data provenance, which is where the data was first created. And by the way, at its last meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, in the object management group, we had a very interesting first discussion on data provenance and pedigree and we formed a new working group about it. So um, this is definitely a topic that is uh, rearing its, uh, its head in the area of records management. Then data residency really in our mind, and, and some people correctly, uh, we think, responded about that and, and have already had the experience necessary to, to see this, 
but not everyone is at that level of familiarity yet, is really about the rights and obligations of the various parties regarding the data, the various parties being the owner of the data, the custodian of the data, but also the authorities of the country where the data resides. Uh, and there's a big question about whether the fact that the data is passing through a certain country um, on its way to its final destination constitutes residency and if the um, magic algorithms that uh, control routing of packets around the internet causes data packets to pass through country X, does that mean that con country X suddenly has a right to inspect that data or seize it or uh, find in that data whether it tells something about one of their citizens and their activities. So uh, there are lots of refinements to the issue of data residency uh, that uh, take a little while to, to really become aware of. So um, my interpretation of this is in this last paragraph. It's the same as with people. You may be a resident of a country, and then you may be located in another country at a certain time, um, if I'm uh, a resident of the United States and uh, like I will uh, do next Monday and Tuesday, I will happen to be in London uh, and if I need to drive or um, follow the rules of even how to be a, a legal, a lawful pedestrian on the street, etc., I will need to follow the rules of, of, of the disunited kingdom. Uh, for a little while, pardon the pun. Um, even though I'm a resident, I'm not a resident of the UK. I'm a resident of the US, um, but I will be temporarily placed under certain restrictions. Even though I expect that if I run into a problem, I can run to the US embassy and get some form of protection. So that's the same distinction between location and data residency that applies to a person. So having um, tried to get people to tell us what they think about data residency, and I think it, it tells us some, interest, some very interesting things about pe what people do understand and where we may still need to educate people about the concept, when we asked who, as a result of this understanding, is in charge of data residency management within a company, we got quite a variety of answers that you can see here uh, summarized. And um, it seems that basically just about every management function in the organization gets involved. Um, sometimes the CEO, uh, sometimes, but you, you wonder in some cases whether the CEO you know, has the time or has the, the focus to really deal effectively with data residency. Uh, you, of course, have the CIO or the CSO, the chief security officer, sometimes. But, uh, and, and sometimes you have the business lines, and in particular for people who offer cloud services, it's their cloud division general manager who is typically considered to be in charge of data residency issue, which does cover a large chunk of the data residency issues that that company may have, but it certainly doesn't cover data residency issues about their own data, which may not be located in the cloud that they themselves offer. Uh, and you, you can see, for instance, the second answer, which is a direct quote, various roles, including policy, security, technical, legal, information modeling. Well, if there is that many roles involved in governing uh, data residency, uh, you, you, the question is, again, where is the accountability? Uh, so that is definitely something that we um, um, that, that we saw and, and that uh, is very enlightening, a little bit concerning, but definitely an opportunity for progress and, uh, and education. Uh, we asked people uh, what types of data posed, posed potential data residency risks in their organization. Not surprisingly, uh, there was a strong focus on what we call PII, personally identifiable information and a subset of PII or an augmentation of PII, which is PCI, patient care information in the medical field. Um, so you have all the normal things like social security numbers, contact information, tax information, banking information, um, 
you know, criminal history, background checks in employment, the location of people and their past location, etc. Uh, and in places where uh, you have significant video surveillance, uh, video surveillance happening, uh, the, the residency of these recordings, whether they are stored in the country or somewhere else, can definitely be an issue, uh, especially given the uh, emergence of face recognition software in recent years. Uh, we have uh, people who have concerns, of course, about their intellectual property. So manufacturing companies are wondering if they use a cloud service to store all their product data, uh, where that is, and whether it, as a result, could be prey to um, potentially government-sponsored industrial spying. Um, all sorts of basic productivity information, email calendars, etc. And a few people mentioned something that in the um, data residency working group at the OMG we're very well aware of, in particular because, as Tracy said, I come from the energy sector, and so I am very aware of the issues of sovereign data when it comes to, in particular, oil and gas resources of country where those resources are considered a natural asset. And we had some respondents mention it, but very few. Uh, but that is definitely something that uh, needs to be considered, is um, what happens when that data is being processed by contractors who are uh, moving that data to another country in order to process it, because that's where their computing resources are, and then potentially are returning the processed data to the country of origin, but the data has been stored in another country in the meantime, and it's considered quote-unquote, sovereign data. And then we have a number of people who said, well, we're a cloud provider, so in a sense, we don't know and we don't care. Our customers put data in our cloud, and they're responsible for their data. And we think that, I mean, that's, of course, understandable. It is true that the cloud provider doesn't know and, and arguably shouldn't know what is in the data. Nonetheless, they could be caught between a rock and a hard place. They, they could be the ones that a law enforcement authority goes to or that an attacker attacks in order to get that data. So they cannot completely, um, if you want, wash their hands of uh, the, the type of data they are, are uh, the custodians of, and that, that certainly creates a, a risk for the provider. Um, but that's the, the answer we got generally at that point. And it is, it is understandable and, and potentially legitimate. Uh, from that um, question about the data, uh, the nature of the data, we went naturally to you know, what are the, the scenarios that expose the data to residency issues. So we have that in the form of questions both about the data and about the nature of the risk. And um, people mention data center consolidation. If you have a data center in one country, and you close it down in order to consolidate it with a data center in another country, automatically that means that some data is going to be moved. Does that create a problem? Um, the move to cloud-based storage, so if you had on-premises on storage and you decide instead to put that in the cloud and the cloud is not hosted in your own country, uh, what does that uh, create uh, as a risk? Uh, similarly, outsourcing uh, for the same reason, but um, you also have outsourcers who you don't think they have the data, but in reality they do have access to the data. So if you have a call center in India, uh, the technicians in, uh, in, in Bangalore may have access at least to certain data records as they process a, a trouble ticket. Uh, does that constitute a data residency issue? Does that mean that that record suddenly has become accessible to people in the country where the call center is hosted? Uh, companies that expand their business internationally uh, may uh, be offering a service to users from a new country. Uh, those users then, uh, by virtue of using your application, are now depositing some data in systems that are not in their home country? Do they realize it, and does that expose their data to, to unintended access? Uh, we had uh, several people mention a very interesting situation we hadn't frankly thought about initially. Uh, there is research data, in particular now 
in the genomic area, that is, the data sets that are supposed to be anonymized, the name or identity of the people whose data is in the data set is supposed to be hidden, and that data is being licensed and shared across boundaries, but we know that people have become very sophisticated about re-identifying data, finding some metadata or doing some correlations that allow them to find whose data it is, and therefore there's a risk. And finally, a lot of people um, raise the issue that with the emergence, the rapid emergence of Internet of Things solutions, we are going to have uh, a growing risk that data acquired from sensors uh, are, is going to be hosted uh, in a different jurisdiction than where the data was captured, and we'll actually see later that there is a specific incident related to this that was reported to us by one of the respondents. Uh, I think I already covered uh, this issue during the summary. Uh, people think that the risk is moderate. They think they're estimating it correctly, and cloud providers think that the risk is with their customers. Um, we had a very interesting response from an IT services provider who said, the risks are really not just to us, company X. Uh, the risk is that really if uh, data residency becomes a strong deterrent or strong concern, uh, something that really makes people think twice about choosing a cloud service, for example. Uh, if there are well-publicized cases or difficult cases about um, unintended access to information located in the cloud, it's really going to threaten the whole industry. Uh, and that would, be, that would be really bad. Um, we saw some of that actually on June 15 last year when we were coincidentally, as I said, meeting in Berlin at the same time as the EU um, was drafting a new uh, directive about data protection. That directive was leaked on that day, probably by a committee member who didn't like it, and immediately there was a, uh, a raising of the, of the shield in the cloud industry, and several people uh, wrote uh, in, in technical publications or were quoted as being interviewed by journalists before the end of the day, saying if this data directive passes in its current draft form, this is going to kill the cloud industry uh, or the ability of even foreign cloud companies, especially American ones, to do business in Europe. So, so there is a risk there to the industry as a whole, not just to uh, a company about its own data. Um, what is the potential impact on uh, companies? Uh, again, good segue from the previous question. So more generally, what is the potential impact of any restrictions that might be placed on the location of data by regulations or that people would impose on themselves in order to avoid running into problems with data residency? Well, it could uh, create difficulty in providing IT services across the border. That's what I just mentioned, the, uh, the June uh, 2015 draft of the directive. A higher cost to customers because instead of uh, being willing to buy maybe a cheaper service in another country, they might be limited to buying certain services that are in-country that may not be as economical. It would obviously, it would essentially cut down on competition, especially in, so in smaller countries. Uh, it would potentially limit the ability of people to consolidate their data centers or to use an outsourcer um, or to create a remote operations center that controls operations across multiple countries. There is already a, um, an example of that having happened in the oil and gas industry, and that is not new. That happened about 10 years ago where a particular country said, you cannot remotely control our drilling operations from another country. You have to put this remote operation center within our own country, which prevented some consolidation that would have, uh, uh, that would have been beneficial. And then uh, finally, the backup issue comes up because you have to think not only of your live data, but where is the backup being done? And uh, if you, again, have to do the backup within your own country, and if you're perhaps limited 
in the number of professional providers of online remote backup in your country. It might be 15 miles from where you, your office is instead of being several hundred miles away. And so if there's a, an earthquake or a hurricane or some other uh, major disruption, uh, your backups may be just as unavailable as your primary data. So these are the types of implications that uh, have been mentioned by our respondents. So two specific incidents were mentioned. Um, we, uh, and, and of course, the, the, the companies in question are not, well, the, in the first example, the company is not named. In the second, it is. Um, there is um, a case where uh, the security officer of a, of a company basically rejected storing data externally um, because storing the data externally itself might have been acceptable if it had been within Europe, but the, um, the, the, the European uh, entity in question uh, would have put its data and that would have created uh, log data from the managed service that would have been hosted outside of Europe. And uh, after examining the sort of legal access to that data that it would have been that would have been provided to the authorities of the hosting country, the security officer rejected that solution. The second example is closer to the IoT issue that we mentioned earlier, Internet of Things. Uh, the German Automotive Association, ADAC, um, looked at what is going on in, in modern connected cars. What is the kind of data that is uploaded to the manufacturer's um, uh, servers in order to monitor the performance of the cars? And uh, the problem is that because, uh, of course, cars from various brands are being sold across borders, uh, this upload of data from the car uh, may cross borders. And uh, the, the ADAC published the results. Uh, there's, there's actually a website where this is uh, located. And um, they have no authority, of course, to, to prevent that from happening and might not be desirable even from the, the, the viewpoint of the driver who, who wants monitoring of the performance of their car potentially in order to receive alerts. But they certainly requested from the manufacturers that they be more transparent about um, telling the drivers when you drive, the following data is going to be collected and it's going to be moved to our servers in Detroit or our servers in, um, in Yokohama. Uh, and that is the kind of concerns that, that people are unaware of uh, typically. So then we moved on to the, the proactive part of the survey and we asked people, um, what, what do you think we could help with at the object management group? And we suggested some things in the RFI uh, so that people wouldn't stare at a blank page, but we also opened it up to other suggestions. So we suggested that we would publish a discussion paper, and that is what we are going to do. Discussion paper is what most of you might know as a white paper. At the OMG, we call them discussion papers. Um, that we might uh, collect the information about the types of data that, that is problematic and make it into a published taxonomy. That, of course, could be part of the discussion paper or it could be a separate document. We haven't decided yet. And then the big question is which existing OMG standards can we expand to address data residency issues and possibly which new standards uh, might we uh, might we need, and these would fall, we think, into categories. Uh, can we standardize the metadata about data provenance, locations, and restrictions that would allow a data set to be accompanied by metadata that would help manage it? And then could we actually implement in, in middleware, for instance, uh, well, middleware or actually even in operating systems or in, in network routers, et cetera, um, uh, a standard capability that would allow the movement of data to be either restricted or at least monitored if the metadata says this data should stay in uh, the UK, for instance, 
can we detect that um, someone is trying to move that data outside of the UK and can we at least flag it if, if there's some sort of middleware capability that can be implemented. Uh, and this is far, a bit far-fetched, but that's, that's obviously potentially part of our roadmap. People also said, uh, that's the right column on this slide, we really uh, would like to share best practices from, from people. Um, I'm pretty sure that people would want this to be anonymized, but we, we as the OMG can facilitate that potentially by being the, the editors of a, of a best practice um, thing. Now the, you have to realize that the role of the OMG is, is not just education. Our organization is a, is a standards developing organization, so um, we can't we can't be everything to everyone, but we are going to consider these, uh, these requests. Publishing an online bibliography that is really, in particular, a catalog of all the regulations and the standards that people should know about, as well as other papers and articles on this, on, on this topic. Um, there's been a request, can we have a sort of a newsletter or frequent updates, alerts when a new regulation comes out, again, that represents a certain amount of work that is a little bit different from setting standards, so we have to consider that, but I'm just reporting here, regardless of the feasibility on what the findings were. Uh, adopting privacy policy ontologies for transnational use, so that um, basically jives with the, the next to last point on the left-hand side, what a standard set of metadata that could be related to ontologies also. Uh, there is a question of addressing the data in transit. I mentioned that point. Uh, this was sort of phrased as a question in a couple of responses to the RFI, but it seems to be quite a valid point. And then uh, the question of en data encryption. Most people say, well, if I want to store data outside of my country and I'm concerned about other people accessing it, I'm just going to encrypt it. Yes, but some countries say if you put encrypted, if you store encrypted data in this country, some legal authority, uh, maybe some ministry of homeland security or whatever, needs to have access to the secret key. Uh, so, by virtue of placing an encrypted data set in another jurisdiction, are you actually also committed to committing to delivering the secret key to a foreign government office, in which case, at least from the standpoint of privacy versus that government, uh, it sort of negates the intent of having encrypted the data. So these are all questions that, um, that people would like us to address. Um, so, I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of move to the conclusion in order to leave uh, close to 20 minutes for Q&A, and, and uh, you, can, you can start populating the questions if you want based on that by, by clicking on the, on the question button on your screen. Um, so basically, what have we learned through this exercise? And by the way, having, uh, having really participated um, very actively in this from the drafting of the RFI in December until now, um, I, I, I think we are learning a lot and, and there's a, a lot of these conclusions and these findings that are going to be um, very educational for people already. But the main thing is, yes, data residency is a challenge. It can be a serious challenge uh, and it's a challenge not just for users who don't necessarily know where their data is, uh, but it's a serious challenge for the IT suppliers themselves who find this potentially a threat to their ability to do business. Um, we definitely at the Object Management Group are committed to helping, at least uh, the first step is very clear. We're going to take these findings, we're going to write them more completely, we're going to add some analysis to what people uh, sent us, we're going to add references and bibliography and uh, you know, whatever else we can glean from the various meetings we have been conducting now for a year on this topic and we will publish this. And then we're going to look at how can we help within the scope of the mission of the OMG, so what standards might help about metadata 
uh, and is there also a way to formally describe uh, data residency and regulations uh, using some, some formalized language, just like o OMG has this standard called Semantic of Business Rules and Business Vocabulary, SBVR, which describes in, in, in formal English, if you want, the content of a business document, we could imagine doing the same thing for uh, data residency regulation and created a, creating a formal expression that lifts ambiguity about what data residency regulation contain. Uh, so the, that's, the, that's the, um, the, 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 the short conclusion. Um, in this, this leads us to this roadmap slide. So these are the sort of five phases of this effort. At the top, we had this data residency working group, which we started in, in June last year. It is going on. Uh, we're going to meet um, in uh, September in Chicago to discuss the, or to work on the discussion paper, the, the results of the RFI um, transformed into a paper, potentially consider any new responses we might have gotten in the meantime. Um, so, uh, so the working group is, is, is ongoing and uh, we certainly encourage people to join us. Uh, that led to the request for information. We had a deadline of May 9, but um, we're not too picky about receiving late answers because we still have time to integrate them in the discussion paper. So um, uh, the RFI is available from the OMG website. Actually, if you Google OMG data residency RFI, you'll probably land on that page directly. Uh, and, and we certainly invite more responses. The analysis of responses and the creation of the discussion paper is something that is starting uh, almost immediately. Uh, we'll probably have a draft of that discussion paper at the Chicago meeting in September, and we'll probably complete it and release it by the end of the year, of this year, uh, at which point we will have roadmap discussions of what are the standards that we could try to uh, make emerge. And the way the OMG process works, and it's a very open process, uh, OMG is a member-driven organization, uh, you take out of it uh, what you put into it, etc., uh, is that if we deem useful to create some new standards, then we draft and approve and issue requests for proposals, and it is the members who come up with proposed specification for a new standards. It's not the, uh, the OMG staff, which is very small. It's the members who come together and work out a proposed new standard, and then we go through a, an open process of discussing it and approving it and, um, and, and, and publishing it. And that would start next year, in 2017. And um, some of these efforts, uh, we go very fast compared to organizations like uh, ISO, but it still takes a couple of years to go from um, issuing an RFP to converging on a, specific, on a solid specification and, uh, and, and publishing it. So potentially by uh, you know, 2000, the end of 2018 or more probably 2019 would be when some standardization um, of whatever kind is determined by the members uh, would emerge. So um, again, uh, new answers to the RFI are still helpful, so you're welcome to find this RFI and respond to it. And again, your responses can be anonymized, if you so wish. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, two upcoming meetings, Chicago in September, San Diego in uh, December. Uh, it's sometime during that, that week, we haven't decided yet, usually it's on the the Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, uh, so, but, but the schedule will be posted on the OMG website uh, pretty soon. We have a mailing list, data residency at omg.org. If you want to join it, you have to send an email to request at omg.org. Uh, and there's not a special syntax. This is actually read by a human, believe it or not. Uh, and it, a nice human too, but you, you can be polite, like the grandmother in England uh, making her Google searches. You can say, please add me to the data residency mailing list. 
uh, in that message to request.omg.org, and you will be added to the mailing list to which we do not send very many messages, but we keep people posted on, um, on what we do. So with that, there's 15 minutes left, and I'm going to pass the baton back to uh, Tracy Berardi in order to moderate the Q&A period. Great. Thanks, Claude. How is my uh, phone connection this time? Right now, you're, go you're doing fine. Oh, good. I'm sorry about before. Um, we do have a couple questions. And uh, now's a great time um, if, if you have any lingering questions that aren't yet in. Um, first question, what, what, what was the most surprising RFI finding? Tracy, I, I can perhaps, uh, I mean, I, we'll all have our own answers to that, but I could perhaps just pitch in there. This is Andrew Watson. I'm OMG's technical director. Um, I'll come to that, answering that question in a second, just a couple of observations. First of all, thank you very much indeed to Claude, who did uh, essentially all of the heavy lifting on analyzing the responses to this RFI. Um, perhaps one of the most surprising things for me about the responses was just how many of our responders asked for anonymity. Uh, we thought that perhaps you know, one or two might. Um, we ended up in a rather good news, bad news situation in that we actually had responses from many of the big names in the cloud service industry. Unfortunately, I can't tell you who they are because uh, all of them said, uh, we're willing to share our observations with you. We're very happy for those observations to be anonymized and aggregated and distributed as part of your analysis of the RFI responses, uh, but you can't say who we are. And in most cases, they said, you can't even say that we responded to this RFI. So this is an issue, and as I say, I was somewhat surprised just how widespread this, um, this, this extreme caution is in the industry. I take from this that it's a widespread problem. As one of our responders said, it's a problem that does potentially threaten the entire basis, I mean, without wishing to sound overdramatic, it potentially threatens the entire basis of the cloud industry. The whole premise upon which cloud is built is that you as the customer don't have to care where your data is. It just magically is served up to you when you ask for it. It's provided out of the cloud. Um, but of course, what data residency is about is examining the, 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 the problem that actually there are cases, there are potentially quite uh, a lot of them, where you absolutely do have to care what regulators, regulatory jurisdiction your data falls into. So we learn from this that it's potentially quite a widespread problem. Um, there is awareness of it, uh, and of course this has been heightened, only heightened by things like the recent collapse of Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor, an agreement struck between the EU and the US um, over a decade ago precisely to address data residency concerns by European uh, data managers uh, who had to comply with European data regulations. Um, Safe Harbor collapsed about a year ago and is possibly going to be replaced by the EU US Privacy Shield, except that actually a lot of people I've talked to are not putting a lot of faith into that process. So you know, there is, I think, concern across the industry about that. Um, and as I say, because we had so many confidential responders, that was perhaps one of the bigger surprises for me. Um, we nevertheless are in the slightly catch-22 situation. As Claude mentioned, if we, OMG as an organization, are going to be able to provide solutions in this area, we do need um, the people who are concerned about this issue but are wary of coming forward. We do need them to work with us to, to help provide solutions to this. Perfect. And, and Claude, um, do you have anything to add before we go on to the next question? Mm, well, not, not really. I mean, I think Andrew's answer is, is really a good one. Uh, on my part, I think the one thing that surprised me a little bit is uh, how many companies have not really uh, organized themselves to put the ultimate accountability for data residency uh, clearly in the hands of one person. Um, and the, the, the fact that it, it looked like almost like people were um, answering the, our question about roles and responsibility by saying, oh, well, let's see uh, who should be responsible for this. And then they were naming just about every function that, that would be impacted. But it, it 
it almost sounded like off the cuff answers and, and that the, the policy inside the, the companies about uh, data residency, for instance, is, uh, I mean, it's the, the CISO or the CIO or whatever who is accountable. And yes, other functions are involved, but there is a clearly defined line of accountability. That hasn't happened yet, and and I was a little surprised about that. Mm -hmm. And just just one more from me, Tracy. Sorry, I'm, I'm giving you two answers to one question. The other thing that uh, I suppose the one answer that caught me sort of off guard that I sort of read it and I thought I had one of those sort of light bulb moments was uh, the responder who gave us the case study where it wasn't data residency that the data protection officer was concerned about, it was metadata residency. Even if the cloud provider could guarantee that the data itself would be held um, within a particular jurisdiction, the data protection officer was worried about log data, metadata, data about the data being held outside the data protection jurisdiction. And, and I, you know, thinking about it for just 10 seconds, of course, I completely understand that and, and uh, uh, identify with that problem. But it wasn't something that I had previously thought about. So we may have to be concerned not merely with data residency, but also with metadata residency as we address these issues. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, next question is, did examples of data residency risk include the capricious imposition of regulations by poorly informed regulatory agencies? Which regulatory agencies do we want to be rude about on this call? <laughs> poorly informed. Oh. Yeah. Um, I think I saw one response that uh, in which when people were at, when when we asked people what should we do, there was something in the the need for OMG to help educate people where regulatory agencies or legislators were being mentioned as one of the targets for education. It wasn't, um, it didn't, didn't um, say it as crudely as the esteemed audience member here. Um, but so generally, no. Generally, the answer is that wasn't mentioned, except in obliquely by one of the respondents. And I think this is an excellent question, and this is an excellent suggestion. Now, the thing is, of course, we can't claim to influence legislators and regulators. We can only hope that indirectly, if we publish some a, a good discussion paper or other things in the future, that this will work its way to uh, certain people and that it will help make them uh, pass regulations and laws that will be a little, um, a little better, a little more subtle, or a little more cognizant of the, the risks for, for industries. Um, do, you, do you have anything to add, Andrew, to that? Um, I, think, I think the only thing I would say, and that, you know, treading a little carefully here, um, what may from the outside look like, you know, sort of um, ignorance of technology in some regulatory agencies may instead actually reflect conflicting interests, conflicting priorities within a government. Um, I mean, we're all unfortunately all too familiar with um, requirements that are being put on data storage, data providers in many different countries um, that are being imposed by um, basically intelligence services and police forces. Something that makes governments profoundly uneasy, and I, you know, my government is a prime example of it here in the UK, something that makes them profoundly uneasy is the idea that something might be stored on their territory which they can't actually get access to. Um, you know, the idea that there's a safe to which nobody uh, can, can, which nobody can open except the original owner. Um, you know, governments are used to the idea that if I produce a legal instrument, I produce a warrant, whatever, I, c I can get to any information. And some of the, the premise upon which some cloud service is being sold is, is that that's not the case, that only you, the user, can, can get access to that data. And for 99.999% of lawful users, of course, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. But government agencies, I guess, are always thinking about the 0.001% of people who, uh, who are acting illegally, and they want to know that there is some route to getting to that data if they produce the appropriate lawful instruments, warrants, or whatever. 
Um, and for, for some of us in the technology industry, having to comply with those very rare um, cases where those warrants are presented can be enormously inconvenient. You know, it wrecks business models, it, it adds costs, it just seems like um, you know, a huge drag on innovation. But if you look at it from the point of view of the policing agency or whatever, you know, they, they I think, understandably, still take the view that just because you're storing things in electronics rather than on paper doesn't change the fundamental principle that if we produce a lawful warrant, you, the holder of the data, must produce it to us. So I wouldn't say poorly informed regulatory agencies, but I would say that there are conflicting priorities within governments that have not yet been resolved in this area. Thank you, Andrew and Claude. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the key differences between data residency, data protection, and privacy? I'll go with that. Um, so data protection and privacy refer very specifically to making sure that information that identifies me as a person or gives um, critical information that should be uh, shared only between me and some specific individuals like my doctor, my banker, my lawyer, etc., is not exposed to other people. Uh, data residency is really about whether putting data, which may include this kind of data, but may also include other data, uh, putting it in another um, jurisdiction than, than mine um, exposes that data to access that, that I do not intend. So there is a huge overlap between the two. Let's be clear about that. So it is legitimate to ask that question because there is a big overlap. But there's all sorts of other data that, um, th that is not typically considered uh, as an issue of privacy, which is also an issue of data residency. So if you take the example of the genomic data set that's supposed to be anonymized, yeah, you could say it is a privacy issue. But when you talk about the licensing of data, uh, suppose you, you, you have, you're in a country where there is very strong intellectual property laws and a set of genetic data that you've created in the research lab is, um, is uh, copyrightable or is patentable, but you loan that data under license to another research institute in another country, which is in a country where the laws are that genomic data has to be public, open source, and you cannot make money out of it. Suddenly, you've created a, a problem which is, may have nothing to do with the fact that the data is re-identifiable. Maybe it's not re-identifiable at all, but you've created a data residency problem because the ability of the source of the data to protect it using copyright laws or patent laws from their jurisdiction is now violated by the fact that that data has been moved to a country where the copy that's been placed in that country now, according to the laws of the recipient country, can be disseminated without restriction. So this is a, this is a kind of unintended access consequence that in this case has nothing to do with privacy and is definitely a data residency issue. And the other example I'll quote, and we're coming to the end, so I, I don't want to take too long time, too, too long of a time, is oil and gas data or uh, you know uh, uranium mining data or whatever um, that a country says that data is mine and it's a it's a state uh, asset to to have that data. And so there's absolutely nothing about privacy in that, but there is a data residency issue. Someone says, I don't want that data to leave my country. Uh, so data uh, residency is broader than uh, privacy and data protection, although it contains it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And just real quick, um, question about when, when do you think standards might start emerging? And if we want to get 
involved in this effort, what are some things you could do to help the working group? Well, that's a great circular question because actually the two parts of the que the second part of the question is the answer to the first one. And I, I'm not saying that flippantly. You know, I'm, I, I don't mean to make fun of the of the questioner. But the standards will emerge when people come together to decide which standards should we have, and then to work on making those standards emerge. Um, as I said, uh, the OMG does not claim does not have a you know a, a technical staff to create standards out of the blue. Um, it has uh, it, it basically facilitates joint efforts by its members to create these things. So we need people to come to the table. We already have some people, but uh, we certainly could have more to come to the table, discuss where should we go based on what we've learned, uh, and then have some of the technical people who understand issues of metadata and ontologies and uh, uh, you know the, the 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 various techniques that could be applied to solving the problems we've raised to come and say well this is the kind of standards we could have and this is how we are going to specify them um, so uh, so the the question about how you can come and participate is the answer to the question of when can we expect to have to have standards come about um, you can uh, you know, go to the OMG website and, and find the links there. Um, you can participate in the meetings I've mentioned, and you can uh, sign up for the data residency mailing list, where we will obviously announce the, the next step and the next meetings. Um, if you just have a, a, a general question, you can write uh, Andrew at OMG.org. That's Andrew Watson, my friend with the British accent. Or you can email Tracy, that's Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-C-I-E, -E, sorry, T-R-A-C-I-E, at omg.org, and either of them will um, answer and tell you what you can do. Perfect. And we're at the top of the hour. Just a quick reminder, this, uh, this recording, it, it's being captured, and right after we end here, it'll be available on demand. We're going to go ahead and send a message to you to our data residency email list um, so other folks can join in. Um, but thank you again, Claude and Andrew, and for everyone joining us. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for attending.